Welcome to Lectionary Call in for Tuesday, May 10th of 2022, where two laypersons, a pastor and an academician, gather for about 45 to 50 minutes each week to discuss the Gospel Lectionary for the coming Sunday. This Sunday is May 15th. Each Tuesday, we call in from wherever we may be at 6.30 a.m. Eastern Time, and for our friend Charles Willard in Minnesota, that's 5.30 a.m. Our little team is working to be faithful to Lectionary Year C, and that puts us in the Gospel of John on Sunday. We hope this discussion will provide areas of focus and reflection. Here's how we do it. We develop perspectives independently after the lead-off person shares some formative questions. And then in this virtual session, we share and encourage and challenge each other. And here are the folks joining us in today's discussion. Bill Hall, St. Petersburg, Florida. Charles Willard in the Northern Lights. Sarah Mickelson in Tampa. And I'm Don Upton. I'm traveling in Columbus, Ohio today. And our leadoff person is Sarah Mickelson. She's put the questions together. I want to remind everybody, the questions aren't just for us in our discussion. We tee them up because they may be something you'd like to use in a small group discussion or as you moderate the discussion through the week. Sarah, what do you have in store for us today? Well, I wanted to invite everyone to consider where we are in the book of John. This is the final discourse. And we are on Passover night. Jesus has set the table and we're having a meal. The conversation is about what's coming. And Jesus is about to um, be betrayed by Judas. Judas is about to take bread from his hand and walk out to do what he must do and do it quickly. Um, Peter is going to... Uh, argue with Jesus about his loyalty and be told that he's going to betray um, Jesus three times before the cock crows. And we pick up as all of that has occurred and Judas has left the room. Um, So starting in chapter 13, verses 31 through 35. When he had gone out, Jesus said, Now the Son of Man has been glorified, and God has been glorified in him. And if God has been glorified in him, God will also glorify him in himself and will glorify him at once. Little children, I am only with you longer. You will look for me, and as I have said to the Jews, so now I say to you, where I am going you cannot come. I give you a new commandment, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you should also love one another. And by this, everyone will know you are my disciples, if you love one another. That's some pretty hefty final language. And I'm struck by the difficulty of the commandment. So that led me in my questions this week. And my first question opens with, why is Jesus' example of loving so difficult for us to follow? What prevents us from loving others as Jesus did? So as question number one, Bill, where would you like to begin with this? Thank you, Sarah. You set this in context. I would simply add that this short passage is sandwiched, if I may use that language, between Judas's leaving and following this, the discourse with Peter about denial. I think that is significant, and I think it gets at what I think is the heart of your question. In our humanity, to be betrayed, uh, to have a trusted companion of at least three years refused to even know us later. And Jesus knew that. And yet in between those two narratives in the gospel of John are these four verses uh, that say, love one another. Uh, and, And verse 35, I think is so powerful and is the heart of it. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Not your theological preciseness, uh, not your um, prestige, your your 
most powerful witness I take Jesus to say is the ability to love each other. So part of what makes it difficult is we are human. And if, and, and I have experienced uh, what I would call betrayal in my life uh, and ministry. And I remember well the hurt and the anger and the desire to um, get back um, though that context, Sarah, does not in our humanity engender love. So the kind of love that Jesus is talking about, part of what makes it difficult is it's a choice. Uh, Jesus is demonstrating his capacity to choose to love and to choose to believe that his disciples are capable of that kind of love, even in circumstances that would influence and even drive someone to anger, to to being reactive. Um, Washing their feet, uh, offering them the meal, um, being with them and the intimacy of that, that whole context. And in that context, to have someone leave to betray you and another refusing to face into his capacity for denial. Uh, I I will just end with, I think the whole context is in a sense, the answer to your question, Sarah, is the the gospel in, in another question, you use the word radical. This is a radical call to act counter to our human tendency. Thank you for the question. You're welcome. Charles, do you have any thoughts about why why this example is so difficult for us to follow and what prevents us from um, loving others like Jesus did? Was that directed to me? Yes. Okay. I, uh, I've been thinking about this passage uh, more closely as our conversation at the beginning of the morning really at the beginning of the morning, began to discuss and to turn to this this conversation that Jesus was having with his disciples. And I I find it is it's hard for it's hard for I won't say us, it's hard for me to imagine. The the context in which Jesus is having this conversation with his disciples is just so completely different from any experience that I have in terms of, I mean, this conversation, for example, is not like the one that Jesus is having with his disciples. Um, and I, so I'm, I just have, I'm having a very difficult time in, in imagining what this might be like. I can, I can think about it, but having any, any direct experience that would be similar to the ones that the disciples, it, it, it's just at, at every point where we are and how we got to where we are and what we think about and what we base what we think about on is just for me, as I think about it this morning, not, is not real. I'm stopping. John, what are your thoughts? What Charles said is everything to me. That was that's where I woke up with that. You know, some mornings we were getting ready for podcasts and I was telling Bill before we got started recording this, I opened my eyes Tuesday morning. He said, Wake up about five AM, maybe a little earlier to get ready. And some mornings I open my eyes and I'm thrilled. I just want to have the conversation. Can't wait to see the four of you. Can't wait to talk to folks who listen to this. This morning, one of those mornings, I opened my eyes and said, oh, no. And, you know, Charles said, to the point of not real. And I like, I like what he said a lot. And so I started writing down, even this morning, that not real. And I'm using the book of John to do it. So I, we go on and on. But for me, six things that in John make this not real. And I'm not throwing out there to say impossible. But I think it, 
saying things like that goes a long way for me. For Charles, it almost, as I was writing down the points, it became a prayer of confession as a starting point. So think about, I don't like chapter headings of Bible because they just are too shallow. They don't, but if you have them in your Bible, before you go through this exercise, because Sarah's got this great question, just go through the headings and see, what was John about? What were they doing? What were they doing? And so in the context of John, here's the six. The first is, well, this is not real. It's not possible because I want reciprocity in my love. And so, oh, where's my confession? Oh, Lord, my heart says I want reciprocity, not flowing, flow, not unconditional. I want reciprocity. Two, aligned with what I believe the code of love and service should be. If you're out of step, now think about John. It's, I mean, it's like that's the conversation, right? It's not reciprocal, Jesus. It's not aligned. They don't love you. They want to harm you. They want to harm me. It's not aligned. Oh, Lord, in my prayer of confession, help my heart who's looking for alignment with what I believe love to be. Three, I want to protect myself. Authentic love can't confront me with my failures. After all, oh, love, oh Lord, a prayer of confession. I want love that only can protect me. I don't want to be vulnerable. Number four, I want proper love. Whatever I think that may be, love's, love's got to follow a course, certain kind of course. Oh, love, and my prayer of confession, forgive me. I'm imposing upon my Lord and my God a proper love that's in my heart. Number five, give me a love that's not disrupted. So I'll replace your word radical, Terry. You've got to use that through the morning with, well, as long as it's not disrupted. Oh, be still my heart. <laughs> my prayer of confession. Oh, forgive me, Lord. I only look for love that I can label as not being disruptive in my life. And the final one is, oh, give me authentic love, but that's in my terms. Oh, Lord, forgive me. I am imposing my love on the identity of the Lord Jesus Christ and forgive me. So, Charles, when you said not real, I just started going down my list. And I'm not I'm saying them from my heart, of course, because you wanted me to answer personally. But I can overlay that on the story that the writer of John tells. And it is you know, the disciples. What are they looking for? Reciprocity, alignment, self-protection, proper love, uh, not disruption, but sustainability, let's get this done, let's get ourselves fair, fed, and authentic in terms of their own hearts going forward. So uh, thank you, Charles, and that's that's my list. Oh, Lord, help me. <laughs> you know, I, I, I agree with that 100%. I, I wrote, loving people is just hard. <laughs> just hard. Well, it's I mean, hard. people, come on, right? People, yeah. Yeah. It's hard to put someone else, something else, everything else ahead of ourselves. It is hard to love yourself the way Jesus loved. Um, it, it's hard not to barter, to deal with what we want. And, and I call that the transactional kind of love where um, if you loved me, you would do these things. If you loved me truly, this is what it would look like. So we have not only defined love, but we have defined the expectations of those who love us, which is even more problematic. Um, to love unselfishly and wholeheartedly, to love not just Jesus, but the whole world. <laughs> Woo. Okay, that's the commandment. It's not that we just love Jesus this way. And Jesus loves us this way. We have to love each other and the whole world this way. Um, and Don, I, I'm glad to hear you use the word, word vulnerability because I think it requires that. Parenting love seems to be the kind of love that, that in, in my imagination, in my life experience, is the most like this love that Jesus shares or Jesus commands us to feel. I think... Um, Parents, I've seen parents go without many things for the benefit of their child. Sleep being number one, food being number two, financial gain or wealth being number three, community being number four, all for the love of a child. It seems to be where God is coming alongside 
when you have that kind of vulnerability and that kind of sacrifice, there's God in it. And I am, I'm with you. I'm kind of um, completely befuddled on how to do this. Um, and, and I think what prevents us is the fact that it is difficult. It is difficult to get out of our own skin and look at it from a perspective that's not self-driven or a preservationist in its in its thinking. So I think that that this this could this question could rattle on in my head for a good two months, maybe three, and I still wouldn't have a good answer. It's just hard, and hard is something I try to avoid. <laughs> And that's a bad thing. So question number two, do we and others need to experience and understand this radical love before we can love others? I I promise you I don't normally ask a yes and no question. This is one of those. But I'm going to throw it out there anyway. Do we need to experience and understand this kind of radical love first before we can love others? Don, what do you got? I got you. Got to stop asking all these hard questions. Oh, number one was enough, and then you do this. Please. <laughs> and I and I love the question. And the yes and no is where I went. And so I'm going to break what you're asking for. Is go. If you have to answer it yes and no for each each perspective. I think I think this is the Christ of coming and going. I'm coming to you. I'm going where you can't. I'm coming to you and I'm going. So I I had to go yes and no for both. Forgive me. And so for do I need the incoming experience? Do I need to see it? Do I need to see it acted out? Yes, I guess so. But, you know, to the point we've been making, mm, tough, still tough, but I need to see it. And I think going to John, there is, since much of John's written linearly, there is a happiness in it. There is a you go through the day and there's, a, there's someone's hungry and they are fed. The sun comes up, the sun goes down. There's opening and closing. There is laughter. There are reunions. It's a fullness. So I, I would say yes, but maybe not in the the way we talked about in the answer to question one. That, that it is tangible. Yes. Do I understand it? Can I do it? I don't, I don't think so. I can't wrap my head around it. But I do need to see it. And the literature gives it to us. I'll also say no. Because it's it's separate from me, and when I first read your question, I was just going to say no, because it's not me. I, I think John, I think that book says you can't just see it. But when Jesus says, "As I have, or like I have you," if I understand the translation, it says that you feel it, and you see it, is tangible, which means it's a matter of the heart. And one of the now, this is rude, but, you know, the great book of John, I'm going to be a critic of the book of John, forgive me. But, you know, what's unspoken, what the writer leaves out is all those little things when their bite went on for them. And maybe it's just too mundane. Maybe they just didn't write that way. Maybe we weren't thinking that way, that they're feeding each other. You know, how do they get from city to city? How do they, yeah, I, I learned from the gospel someone's keeping the treasury. I learned that they fan out and get food for the night, but there's not really enough detail as we might have in modern literature, and what they're doing for each other. That someone steps on something. They need a medical attention. I mean, all of that is there because they wouldn't have been the moose of the day very well. But the tangibility in terms of these people isn't there, and you have to read it in. So yes and no. And then for the personal experience, it's yes and no as well. So do I have to see it, and is it away from me? Do I see it acting out the love of Christ? Yes. Is it really necessary for me to see the outside? No, love is the creation. Love is a part of the creation. The reunion of Christ, the forgiveness of Christ, that's a, that's a, that is a task. That is something that we can, we, there is a promise that we can experience. So those are my yes and no, Sarah. I'm loving it that you landed in the same camp I did. <laughs> Bill, what are your thoughts? Well, um, uh, I try when I'm asked a yes or no question to give a yes or no answer and then to interpret it. So I will say yes. <laughs> and I would answer it 
to begin with this way. Uh, first of all, an observation. What Jesus is asking, and, and sort of echoing what I said in your first question, this is totally counterintuitive. First John chapter 4, verses 18 to 20. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Those who say, I love God and hate a brother or sister are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. Now, an interesting uh, observation. The word love in those three verses occurs eight times times and each time whether it's talking about god loving us or our loving others is a form of the greek verb word agape which is god's unconditional unmerited unlimited love for us and you this is where i thought radical fit in one sense I want to believe I cannot love as God. The only God can love as God does. But John chose, among other Greek verbs that were available to him, to use the most powerful and challenging word for love, that I think, in, in the Greek at that time. So eight times... The love that's talked about is agape love. So, yes, I must, it says, we love because God first loved us. Forgive others as Christ has forgiven you. And then as a husband, Well, it sounds like uh, Bill might uh, have a technological problem. Bill, we can't hear you. Oh, so, can, there you go. Can you hear me now? I can pick up where you left off, brother. You had about thirty. <laughs> he doesn't know where he left off. <laughs> I'm, I'm. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can now. I, I I'm sorry. Uh, you're you're coming and going, and I'm coming and going. <laughs> Should so I dial back in? Second, uh, Bill. Yeah, you. Okay. Um, I forget where I was. I was quoting uh, Ephesians 5.25, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church. I don't measure up to that, even though I've had 57 years <laughs> of practice. Um, and I'm sorry for the technical challenges. Uh, yes, it is radical, and yes, I must. Charles, do you have any thoughts about this? You're on mute, Charles. Uh, thank you. I, I think I think we have no capacity to understand this kind of love. I mean, I just I think in my own life um, I'm 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 rediscovering the the difficulty of an expression of full love for. In this case, my wife Nancy. We've been married for almost 60 years, and I'm only now discovering what love of her means in my life. I have, and I have no no way of knowing really what it means in her life, and it's it's a uh, it's a uh, a very um, troubling and 
uh, scary kind of a kind of an experience uh, to to experience what having to do that, having to express that, having to um, manifest that, and failing so consistently, so miserably, and it's just a, it's a remarkable process. Of shooting something else going on here. Go on, I, somebody else. I'll, I'll, I have to. My my wake up call is coming in, and it's just got to. I've got to do it. Something something do it. Hold on. Um, I'm gonna go with yes and no. So maybe it's ebb and flow. A both and Bill's favorite combination, rather than a yes or a no. Sometimes I think yes that we need to accept that we're loved in this way before we can even bear witness authentically to it for someone else. And then other times it seems that I go in search of this love. I have to be vulnerable. I'm fearful. I need courage and vision from someone else to help me uncover where it abides. And maybe it's only found with the help of someone else. Almost as if you have to hold hands before you cross the street. That kind of thing that you only experience it truly and authentically with someone else instead of all by yourself. And I think that is what forces me to walk out of my um, human perspective and into a much more divine perspective is that the necessary component being the someone else that I have to leave that, which is my sanctuary and my, um, what's the right word? Um, cave and, and walk out into the light to, to, to participate and to understand it fully. So I'm going to go with maybe yes or no, um, or both. And that it's an ebb and flow thing more than, Um, a definitive yes or a definitive no. And somebody said to me, the world is full of color. Why do we insist it be shades of black and white? And I went, hmm. And my third question, and, and this has more to do with, you know, practicality and concreteness in my own nature. Where would you start What action would you recommend or might you recommend as a first step toward loving each other as Jesus did? And I think we've struck a chord. I heard the word confess. I've heard the word uh, be vulnerable. So it's ironic that mine starts with confess and admit that I need help, which is counter to my nature. And then I have to yield to help which is also counter to my nature. Um, and then I have to be willing to to, to try. Um, there's this particular exercise that we do in class that's really difficult for me. Um, it's called a plank with a reach. So you're uh, on your elbows and your toes, and your body's stretched parallel to the earth, And uh, you're supposed to lift one elbow and push your arm forward and reach at the same time. And my whole body goes, no, 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 don't do that. You will fall. You will fall if you do that. And then I learn that I can do it. And it's frightening because every time I have to have an argument with my body that says, let go of the earth, put your arm out and reach. And I I feel like that's this moment that if it were being given to me in an illustration, I would be um, asking God to help guide me to move and give voice to that which he would have me do. So that's my best guess at first steps. Charles, do you have any first steps? No, I'm still intrigued by yours. (laughs) Well, it, it, it might look like a tumbled mess down the stairs, but okay. Bill, what are your thoughts? Of your three questions, Sarah, probably I spent the greatest amount of time on this one. And I got some help from other resources. Caroline Lewis, working preacher, has a commentary entitled Good Shepherd. 
And she makes an observation in there that it wasn't new, but her language. She, in her journey, came to realize she had, and she believes each of us has, an embedded Christology. In other words, there is in us our own embedded image of who Christ is. And it led to her Ph.D. thesis on the shepherd discourse in John 9 and 10. And her commentary on John is one of my, one of the ones I find most helpful. I go there a lot um, when I'm working on John. And that idea, I think the first, my point is, Sarah, I think our first step is, who is Jesus Christ to me? How do I envision him? And in that regard, let me read a quote from Barbara Brown Taylor. Jesus was not killed by atheism and anarchy. He was brought down by law and order, allied with religion, which is always a deadly mix. Beware those who claim to know the will of God and are prepared to use any force if necessary to make others conform. Beware those who cannot tell God's will from their own. I think that's very contemporary and timely. In other words, we need to own up to how we envision a Christ. Now, one potential problem with the Barbara Brown Taylor quote is we may see it as they, you know, we can see the speck in other people's lives. That, and yet, uh, I, I resonate with that. The other resource uh, in the Christian century, there's an article by Christiana Peterson, and, and I will briefly highlight a couple of things. She grew up in a, what she says was a Mennonite intentional community. She later married and wasn't living in uh, that kind of community, but it shaped her life. And she quotes a book by Whitney Sanford, who made an in-depth study of intentional communities, um, uh, I guess several hundred of them. And she defines an intentional community as a residential community with a shared vision, shared purpose, some kind of common, common living space, some shared resources, and critical mass. And the title of this article is The Burdens and Blessings of Intentional Community. And uh, among the burdens is if you really want to live this way, it is very difficult because you've got all these different personalities, these different perspectives. And one thing that tends to be characteristic of these intentional communities is nonviolent conflict resolution. And she talks about how difficult that is. Then under the blessings, uh, maybe sort of obvious, if we are capable of mutual problem solving, of sharing resources, knowing that there's enough for everybody and that I don't have to hoard to protect myself, there are uh, potential um, blessings. And the last sentence <clears throat> in Christiana's article is, if our guiding principle is the gospel of Jesus, then we have the church as our community and the spirit of God as our aid. Um, so first steps, recognize how I envision Christ and how do I envision myself as a member of a community and what cost am I willing to pay for that kind of intentional, and I don't have to join a commune or join an intentional community, um, but it, to me, the important thing, Sarah, is to understand that Christ commands this. How will they know we are followers of Jesus Christ if we love one another? We are commanded, and it is possible, though very difficult. Thank you. Charles? I'm just going to 
extend uh, what Bill's comment was and ask a kind of a question about it. If <clears throat> if it is if we are or were created to walk the path that Jesus invites us to walk, why should it be so difficult? What have we done to goof the process up so much that for us to function in, in a way that is best for us, that is what God wants for us, then why is that so difficult for us to do and to practice and to seek to find ways to do it? And I don't, I, I, you know, it's not too too useful to simply say, here's my question, somebody answer, because I don't have an answer to the question, except that if we look around, somehow uh, doing what's right and and what is what best suits us, if, if that's what our theology is, is to do it in that particular way, why is it so difficult? You know, animals who are certainly not as bright as we are manage to do it very well and successfully. And why is it so difficult for us to do? I don't, and I, I'm 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 frustrated because I don't have a I don't have an answer to that question. Don, what are your thoughts? What are, where would you start? I'm affirming Charles Wilder. I think that's the start. I might have said something different as a young man, but he just, you know, what do you call it, a confession or a struggle? I think that's the right. That's that's where I would try to begin. I'm, I'm just affirming Charles because I don't speak as eloquently as he does. But, I, you know, I'll just write in the margins of what he said that uh, – you know, first step, I wanted to go, oh, oh, let me get my John, the book of John manual out. Let's see, step A, if somebody asked me, what am I going to say? You know, now I'm like, see Charles Willard, that my, step, my first step is going to be, this is tough. This is a struggle. And I think that's a great place to begin because if I'm even, I think we have a promise that the fellowship is there. That, that, that doesn't mean, but I can't do it. But the promise is it comes to you. The, the daily will come to us. We have the privilege of being with each other, even virtually today. And for those listening on the podcast, we, we Zoom so we can actually see each other and we can struggle and share with each other. So we have this promise that we are here together, whether we like it or not, whether you like people or not. And to begin with that struggle or those six items of confession I started with is probably a good first step. Because what's going to unify us? You know, me going, oh, oh, let me get the John Rule book out. A, step one, I think that's going to alienate people, and it won't be authentic, and I don't believe it. So let's, you know, start with the hard stuff, knowing that the fellowship's there. And if it comes up, what am I doing? Am I walking with somebody? Am I walking the extra mile with somebody while I'm saying this is a struggle? That sounds good. Am I having dinner? Are we breaking bread together? Are we talking about our families? I mean, it's... Like the settings there, it's what John keeps taking out that I frustrate with. I want to hear more about what they're talking about over dinner all the time and how they're planning for the next day. It's the undercurrent of everything. And uh, and I think the the love that we're looking at here, I have to remind myself, is not. It's the peace of Christ doesn't mean that it isn't in the, in the situation of disruption, that those, those actually are gathered. It's not at least what my reading of John isn't to say, well, when you arrive here, all the disruption and dif- difficulties of life and human condition go away. There's no arrival on that, but we're together and we can love each other and we can help each other. So in all our diversity, I start where Charles does. How many words there are for snow? Hundreds? Thousands? Really? And I'm supposed to sit down and do step one? I'd rather know how you talk about it. Snow. I'd rather know how you talk about the struggle. Civilizations talk about death and dying in a wide variety of ways. I think it might be a call to, to listen. Uh, and I, I don't know about you, when you say the yes and no of the previous question, 
You know, where did my heart open? Somebody was patient enough with me just to let me talk and didn't have a rule book about it at all. It was mostly about a struggle. And sometimes we had the same words and the same language. That's a, that's a pretty good first step. So I'll, I'll wrap up my when I'm looking at this when Sarah you sent the question. I had a note in my text from 07. And on the same day, our pastor at the time, uh, a senior pastor at Thomas Hill Presbyterian Church, John Debevoise, was focusing in a sermon on last words. Last words in party, last, true last words. These are last words. What do those mean to you? Can you remember when you said goodbye to somebody? Can you remember maybe last words before you see somebody for years to come? And you talk about the weight of those things. And I thought that was sweet. And as a whole sermon, I'm just going to let that lie because I thought it was beautiful. And then in lectionary class, and by the way, this podcast is done to celebrate the life of Bill Wallace, who taught lectionary class at Palmasia for generations. And we're here in great part because of what he did for generations. And he, on that same day, talked about the glorification. You have to look at it in terms of weight, the weight of the day, the weight. And I kind of put those together, the last words of the weight. That's, I'm being very general, but I wanted to highlight for everybody those were there. And Sarah, in that class that day, I mean, you and I in 07 were probably sitting near each other. Somebody in that class, I didn't write their name, said, is this saying that Jesus be who Jesus is? I would not be who I am if not for you, if not for all of you, all those people around him. And I just thought that was a beautiful note. I, I don't know who said that, but it was beautiful. Those are my thoughts, Sarah. Oh, so I have a couple of Charles quotes. Do the next right thing. Make the better assumption. Those are two that walk with me on a daily basis. So I think that uh, we do better when we are together than we do when we're apart. And that might be the best way to uh, finish this conversation. Amen. Thank you, Sarah. Good to see everybody. Hello to everybody listening in. Palmasia Presbyterian Church is at 3501 West San Jose Street. That's in Tampa, Florida. And for more information, you can go to palmasia.org. That's P-A-L-M-A-C-E-I-A.org. We commend that to you because great prayers, great sermons, reflections, poetry, chance to take communion, and disagreements and agreements about scripture, which is kind of the business of this podcast as well. And you're always welcome, and we'll see you next time.